No one says you have to start creating your speech with your attention getter or even your introduction. There's not one right place to start. You can start wherever you like. Oftentimes, when you have all that information that you've gathered in your research, sometimes people like to just figure out the main points first, and that's okay. So I want to remind you, this video is going to focus in on the body. We'll talk about main points and subpoints, which are our evidence or supporting material. We're going to cover transitions and source citations, which is citing your research. Friendly reminder, if you've listened to my other videos, this is not new. We are creating ideas and organizing those ideas in an outline. We are not writing paragraphs. We are not writing an essay. There is no writing. For those of you who don't love English, then you should be excited about no English writing here. So we are not going to be calling these um, main points body paragraphs. You have to have that right thinking to help minimize that anxiety and when you're overwhelmed with a whole paragraph of information that's going to increase your anxiety so please use the words main points and subpoints instead of body paragraphs we have a clear introduction body and conclusion with a few main points so let's look at main points so your main points are the general information that you want to cover about your topic. It usually ties back and supports your specific purpose. It supports your thesis. And um, you want to word them in parallel word structure or a way that's easy for us to hear and remember. Sometimes an acronym works or alliteration, the same consonant sound, like maybe they all start with R. But you want to name each main point in a way that we can hear it and hopefully remember that main point. And so on your outline, your main point has a name. You don't leave it blank. Okay. For a four to five minute speech, which is what your informative speech is, you really should only have two to three main points. I know our slide says four. That would be a general guideline for speaking. We never really have more than five. But for a four to five minute speech, two or three main points is about all the time you have to cover um, those points. So two to three. And each main point, if those of you are more visual, it's like a binder. Like each of these in this image is a binder. I love the colors, right? Each one is a different main point. And inside are the details and the information about that main point. It's another way just to visualize the information. So our outline is going to have a main, three main points, maybe. And then our subpoints are going to be the details inside. Now, how do you choose your main points? Well, We've learned about organizing and outlining in a previous lesson. You can go back and watch that video or check out the PowerPoint. There are organizational patterns already established that you can just pick from and plug in your information. Like chronological, for example, one, of, one method of organizing chronologically is past, present, future. So maybe you'd want to talk about the past, present, future of ice cream. Right? And so sometimes those organizational patterns can help you in determining. Okay? So go back and look at your research. Think through what do you want to talk about and which organizational pattern might help me. So that sometimes helps you figure out the main points that you want and certainly will help you with organizing those. In which order do you cover those? Then each main point is going to have subpoints. The subpoints are the evidence and your research. So those are your definitions, your opinions, your statistics, examples, your facts, all the details that you've researched. Now you're going to plug that in. And so our main points would be like A, B, and C, and your subpoints are your numbers one, two, three, four. You have to remember outlining protocols. If you have a one, you have to have a two. So you would need at least two subpoints, but you might need three or four, or maybe you need five. You determine the amount of evidence that's needed to support that main point. Okay. So when it comes to persuasion, we have to make sure that this evidence actually supports our argument, but 
that's for persuasion. Here, your teaching is something new. The main point on hot air ballooning might be on equipment, and so I might define some vocabulary for you. I might give you uh, the type, different types of information. I might share an expert's opinion on their favorite piece of equipment, and those would be my subpoints. Okay, so you get to determine what you want to talk about, and um, those would be your subpoints. So it's like all of this in this image, it's color coded. Each one of these file folders, right, is a point, and the subpoints are inside. Just like to provide little visual images for you. Okay, sometimes your subpoints might be very detailed, and you might need to break those down. So sometimes you have sub subpoints which then if you look at our sample outline, uh, because we always do numbers, letters, numbers, letters, if our subpoints are one, two, and three, you might need to have little a, little b, little c to break down a subpoint. Okay? I know sometimes it gets a little confusing. Just look at your examples uh, to help you through. Let's look at how we create flow and how we connect all of our points together. When we talk about connecting our points, we want to create flow in our speech. And it's far easier to remember those few main points than a whole bunch of words. So that's where it helps you with your memory is what's my next main point. But we're also going to add in um, connection or transitions that will also help us with our flow. And it also helps you remember and the audience remember what you're talking about. So when we talk about transitions, there are uh, basically full transitions and then half transitions, essentially. First of all, um, we use transitional phrases, or sometimes they're called signposts, and those are part of our transitions, or sometimes we use those to add structure to our speech. So trans transitional phrases or signposts would be things like in addition to or next. Well, let me describe. Or it might be enumerations, which are first, second, third, or on the other hand. In your speech packet that I've provided for you and in your text, there is actually a table that has a lot of these different phrases already spelled out for you. And so you can just kind of pick and choose. But those are the things that add structure. You want to think of the speech like the construction that's happening in the Metroplex, right? Road closures and lane changes, and there's all these signs posted to give us warning of what's coming up. And we want to do that in our speech. We're kind of mapping out our speech with these road signs to let them know where they where you are because they don't see your outline. They don't know where you are. All they have is your verbal indicators and nonverbal indicators, we'll talk about that in delivery, on where you are. And so we want to guide them through our speech, walk them through the outline. When we uh, are working on transitions, um, they consist of what we call internal previews and internal summaries. So you already know about a preview and an introduction that tells you what the main points are for the whole speech. In your conclusion, on the next video, you'll learn that you summarize all of your main points, and we call those a preview and a summary. When we do it inside the body of our speech, we just call that internal. And so it's not really this fancy, crazy concept. It's just telling the audience what's coming up next. You're just doing it inside the body. So we love when you can add these signposts in front of your subpoints. Would love to hear you do that. That would be a very excellent, superior, um, if we were grading an A thing to do, by being able to say, well, the first piece of equipment you would need for a hot air ballooning is the basket and the envelope. That's what the balloon's called. The next piece of equipment you would find is the piece that fires the flame, which I don't know what that's called. <laughs> but um, I, I'm kind of walking to walking you through. My First, we need this. Next, this. You'll also find this piece of equipment. And, and finally, this piece of equipment. So then I just sort of walked you through each subpoint. I didn't have to say first, second, and third, although I can do that. All right, but that helps walk the audience to where you're going through your speech, step by step. 
you will be graded on full transitions, and full transitions are required between each main point. If you have two main points, you'll have one transition in between. If you have three main points, you'll have two transitions in between. And those full transitions consist of an internal summary plus an internal preview. So here's your formula, those of you who are logical and math oriented, that's your formula. So if we were talking about the hot air ballooning and our first point was equipment and our second point was um, the um, inflation process, we would summarize the point we just covered, internal summary, and do an internal preview telling us what our next point is. And we combine that. So it might sound like, well, I've just explained to you the main pieces of equipment that's necessary for hot air ballooning, but one of the more exciting parts of hot air ballooning is watching it inflate. Let me explain the steps in the inflation process. And so I just did an internal summary of what I just covered, a reminding what I just talked about, and I just previewed what comes next. It's possible to sometimes summarize multiple points. So if I'm moving from the inflation process to the takeoff and flight, I could say, well, so far we've learned all about the equipment needed, the steps in the inflation process, but even more exciting than watching it inflate would be actually taking off and the experience of flying. Let, let me explain the steps in that process. And so I actually summarized internal summary of main point A and main point B and then told you what was coming up. Okay, so these go in between your main points. They don't need a, a letter or a number. They're just in between. And so you can look at the samples, uh, the skeleton sample I have for you, and you can look at your student um, sample outlines that I have posted on the outlines they've submitted for their speeches. The last thing I'm going to go over with you is how to tell, um, tell us your research and how to cite your sources. So let's check out citing sources. You are responsible to be an ethical and responsible speaker. And this day and age, people say things all the time without any research. And just because you say it doesn't make it true. So a critical listener, one who's evaluating the information, needs to be able to assess whether you are an ethical speaker. And are you using unbiased sources in your research? That's crucial with persuasion. There's a little more leniency in informative speaking. And so it's really important to document your sources. I don't believe things people say unless they back it up because too many people state opinions as if they're facts and they're wrong or they just lie or they just repeat it multiple times so it must be true. Do not be fooled. You have to evaluate information everywhere on social media, in politics, in your education. So we want to be evaluative. So being a strong speaker is giving credit where credit is due and just telling us where you get your research. Okay, I understand the temptation of plagiarizing. Oh, they say it better. Okay, so say it the way they said it, but give them the credit. So there's two different parts to citing sources. The sort of the how do I plug it in and how does it fit into my speech and then the what do I say. So how you plug it in or insert it, normally it's, it's with your sub points. And so you would basically state what your point is. Right, then give us the source, National Geographic Magazine, January 23rd, 2014. Um, and give us that, and then you would give us that evidence or the supporting material, the statistics, the story, the fact, the quote. And oftentimes then you summarize that up for the audience so they know what it means. You can play around with this. It doesn't have to be this way. Because sometimes that doesn't work. If you were doing shocking statistics for your attention getter, you would want to say the statistics first and then the source because that would be more impactful. But though this is just a guideline for you, it's not a you have to do it exactly like this. I have some suggestions in your speech packet on citing sources. You're going to hear source citations in the student videos 
that you're going to watch on or maybe have already watched on how to give us what, what a speech is and sounds like. Um, and I have an example for you on the next slide. So when we're citing sources, because we are speaking to an audience who are hearing, we would want to identify the type, that it's a book, it's a magazine, it's a, you know, a professional journal uh, or an academic journal, uh, and that's really helpful for a listener. Okay? We usually include dates of the research as well. We want to give enough information that an audience member could go look it up. Okay. It's a good idea to distribute your sources throughout your speech. If it were me, I would try to have one for each main point so that it sounds like I'm, I'm always referring back to my research um, and not just all three in one main point. Now, you can certainly have more than three. That's the minimum requirement. So if you need two in a main point or three in one main point, go ahead. But I would really like to hear them kind of spread out. You need to remember that source citations are not like the ones we do in English class. They are not the same as essays. Again, we're, we're not providing information that people can read and go back and reread and they can't go back and see. So in a, in a paper, you might say, according to Jones, page 78, that is useless to an audience who has no idea of your works cited page. They can't see it. They never will. And so that is not an effective source citation in a speech. So again, we're not doing body paragraphs. We're not citing our source is the same as we would do in English. It's different. So you will lose points if you're not doing it in the way we do it for a speech. So here's a better an example of what it would sound like in a speech. Instead of Jones, according to Jones, page 78, you would say something like, according to Dr. Samuel Jones, head of cardiology at Vanderbilt University, in a 2000 article in the American Medical Association Journal. That gives the credibility of the quote, and it cites the journal that you got it from. We could then go ahead and look that up and find that information. I have more examples of what you would say, a magazine, a newspaper, right? We don't cite the database. We cite the article that's in the database. And so follow the guideline that's in the packet um, for examples on citing sources. All right, so we now know the requirements for the body. Two to three main points. We need multiple subpoints. Transitions between. We love adding signposts and transitional phrases to our subpoints if we can to add that structure. We're creating ideas and not writing out a bunch of words. One idea per point is the guideline for our outlines. Not just a word, a word is too little, but an idea or a sentence, and then you just explain that in your speech and expand on it. So one point in an outline is about a paragraph of what you might verbally say. So work on it little by little, point by point, and I'm so excited just to learn new things from you in these informative speeches.